a balsors, bádogere esze, a legmogorvább hóember, és az egy négyzetkilométerre jutó bürokratikus intézmények legmagasabb aránya a Földön. Irány Brüsszel! Magyarország állítólagos ellenségeivel fogok beszélgetni EU-s korrupcióról az Európa Parlament brüsszeli pincéjében. a középidőben. Ez a beszélgetős műsorunk második évadának első része. Idén körbeutazzuk Varsót és Brüsszelt, meg persze ingázunk Budapest és Bécs között, hogy mindenféle európaiakkal beszélgessünk szemétről, turizmusról, erdőtüzekről, meg más égető kérdésekről. Erős kezdésként ma az EU-n belüli korrupció lesz a témánk, Brüsszelbe kiránduló magyarként pedig kénytelen leszek ellátogatni néhány kiemelt zarándok helyre, amelyet minden Belgiumban botorkáló magyarnak kötelező felkeresnie. A középidő egy osztrák-magyar koprodukció és az új kedvenc beszélgetős műsorod, ahol európai ügyekről van szó, meg arról, hogy mire kellene jobban ügyelni Európának. Én Paprika Kinga vagyok, a vendégeim pedig válogatott művészek, kutatók, újságírók és szakemberek Európa minden sarkából. Minden második csütörtökön jelentkezünk új adással, úgyhogy iratkozzatok fel most a jobb alsó sarokban lévő gombra kattintva, válasszátok ki utána a kis csengőikont, és aztán még állítsatok be 10-17 további emlékeztetőt, hogy véletlenül sem maradjatok le egyetlen adásról sem. Az adásainkat nézhetitek felirattal is, az alul elérhető 15 nyelv bármelyikén. Na de most már térjünk rá a korrupcióra, amiből engem már megint kihagytak. Az EU földrajz értelemben eltörpül Oroszországhoz vagy Kínához képest, gazdasági szempontból azonban nagyon nagy hatalommal rendelkezik. Hoppá, ez a sziréna azt jelzi, hogy mindjárt adatokkal fogok dobálózni. Az Európai Unió GDP-jét 2024-ben 17 ezer milliárd euróra becsülik, ami a világgazdaság körülbelül egy hatodát teszi ki. Szemléltetésképpen ez körülbelül 6 millió 800 ezer mészáros lőrincnek felel meg. Az Európai Unió továbbá a Föld egyik legnagyobb közfinanszírozója is. Na de hova megy ez a sok pénz? Tényleg mindent arra költik, hogy Magyarországot támadják súnyi módon út- és vasútépítéssel, kórház- és iskolafelújításokkal, meg lombkoronasétányokkal? Egy ekkora pénzcsomóban már csak hazavisznek páran egy-egy köteget szabálytalanul, nem? De! A korrupció becslések szerint évente 179 és 990 milliárd euró közötti költséget jelent az Európai Uniónak, ami a GDP-jének mintegy 6%-át teszi ki. Na most 179 milliárd és 990 milliárd között van némi számszaki különbség. De még ha a konzervatívabb becslést is veszük alapul, ennyi pénzből legalább tízszer elutazhatnánk a Holdra, és még egy lángosozót is nyithatnánk. A Holdon. Piacirés. Ki jönne belőle akár két-három felcsúti kisvasút, meg egy kisebb szelet puskás aréna, vagy, tudom is én, befektethetnénk zöld energiába, felhasználhatnánk az egészségügy fejlesztésére, iskolák finanszírozására. Csak ötletelek. A legfrissebb felmérések szerint az európaiak 70%-a úgy gondolja, hogy jelentős a korrupció hazájában. A közvélemény 2% ponttal romlott a 2022-es adatokhoz képest. És igen, mi magyarok a top listában vagyunk. Na most tisztezzünk valamit. Az összes uniós támogatást 80 án azaz 5 forintból 4-et maguk a tagállamok kezelnek és osztanak szét. Azaz az egyes országoknak nagyon nagy beleszólásuk van a pénzek felhasználásába. Ez persze visszaélésre is módot ad, meg lehetősen az a szövetségi felügyelet mellett. A legnyilvánvaló példa mindenre Tiborcs Istváné, aki néhány év leforgása alatt csodával határos módon az ország leggazdagabbjai közé tornázta fel magát, Tenderek tengerét nyerve köz- és uniós forrásokból. Készült is a visszaélésekről nagy sajtóvízhangot kapott Olaf jelentés. A számunkérés azonban Magyarország hatáskörébe esett volna, aztán valahogy a Magyarország nem mondta felelősségre a miniszterelnök vejét. Az EU felülbírálati lehetőségei pedig hát korlátozottak. Az Olaf alapvető baja, hogy ők csak nyomozhatnak, de semmilyen következményt nem tudnak végrehajtani, amennyiben csalást találnak. Ő mindössze ajánlásokat fogalmaz meg, és a tagország magának eldönti, hogy ez ami történik. És ott mondjuk Magyarország esetében Magyarország eldöntötte, hogy semmi nem történik. Bár a 2010-es évek eleje óta módszeresen zajlanak, az EU nagyon lassan reagált az uniós pénzekkel való visszaélésekre, 
meg a magyar demokrácia megkopasztására, sok-sok évnyi nyomozás, parlamenti jelentésírás és nyilvános elnyebenyézés után 2023-ban végül csak befagyasztottak 10,2 milliárd eurónyi uniós forrást, csak azért, hogy megmutathassák Magyarországnak, hogy az EU elég tökös, vagy hát tudom is, én petefészkes ahhoz, hogy oda csapjon a vétkeseknek. Aztán pár hónappal később feloldották a tilalmat. Most is megy a húzavona, az új képviselők jobbra-balra ígérgetnek. Drága Unió, mi volt a mesterterv? Mivel az EU egy államszövetség és nem egyetlen állam, az intézményei nem egységesek. A jogi hatáskörök korlátozottak és megosztottak, és legtöbbször erős és egységes politikai akarat kellene ahhoz, hogy a szemétségeknek büntetése is legyen. De ha már itt tartunk, látogassunk el egy kiemelt zarándok helyre, amelyet minden Brüsszelbe érkező magyarnak illik megtekintenie. Íme a végzett Eresz csatornája, vagy ahogyan a Google térképen megtaláljátok történelmi emlékhelyek között, az Eresz. Ide jönnek a magyarok, akik Brüsszelben turistáskodnak, hogy megcsodálják ezt a csodálatos helyet, ahol Szájer József legalábbis a rendőrségi jelentés és a média riportok szerint Pucéron csúszott le mindössze egy hátizsákot viselve, miközben éppen egy rendőri razzi elől menekült egy illegális szexpartiból karantén idején. Csak hogy emlékeztessek, nem a szex volt illegális a partiban, hanem a partizás karantén idején, ahol jelentős mennyiségű drogot is találtak a rendőrök. Szájer politikai karrierjének ez egy időre véget vetett, de azért nagyon messze van ez a szexparti Szájer legfőbb bűneitől. Az ő személyében nagyon fontos és kulcsfontosságú európai politikust veszített a Fidesz, ő volt valószínűleg a legbefolyásosabb tagja az Európai Néppártnak a Fidesz részéről, és a, a, az Európai Pártcsoport és a Fidesz viszonyának gyors megromlásához lehetett közel Szájer lebukásának és bukásának is. De hát Szájer a szerzője a magyar alaptörvénynek, ami egyik napról a másikra felváltotta a korábbi magyar alkotmányt, amit senkivel nem egyeztettek, és azóta is olyan gránit szilárdságú, hogy csak minden második héten módosítják, amikor éppen mondjuk hajléktalanokat kellene bebörtönözni, mert szegények hasonló csodálatos okokból. Még dicsekedett is azzal, hogy az ipad írta az alaptörvényt Strasbourg és Brüsszel között a vonaton. Nagyon sajátos dolog éppen ezzel dicsekedni. Szóval nagy szolgálatot tettél nekünk, drága Eresz! Ott jártunkkor összefutottunk egy magyar csapattal, akik épp ide jöttek a tiszteletüket lerúni a balsós bádok csöve előtt. Én itt lakom, itt dolgozom, de családom, barátaim eljöttek meglátogatni, és hát ezt a remek zanándok helyet nem lehet kihagyni egy brüsszeli útból. Ez hozzátartozik, magyarként hozzátartozik a, a, a brüsszeli kultúrához. Nem nehéz azt mondani, hogy egy olyan alkotmány, ami egy iPad-en keletkezik, az nem üti meg azt a szintet, amit egy Európai Uniós alkotmánynak meg kell. Ameddig a kéz elér, magyar matricák és feliratok borítják ezt az amúgy mondén vízzel vezetőt, amit bárki felkereshet. A Google térképen az Eresz néven történelmi emlékhelyként szerepel, határozottan megér egy vizitet. De ha már szájárnél tartunk, te milyen illegális tevékenység miatt szeretnél pucérvalaggal is brutál betépve menekülni, ha LP képviselő lennél? Írd meg nekünk itt lent kommentben, mi pedig színpadra visszük a legjobb javaslatokat. Én személy szerint a kontinentális befőtt kereskedelem megzavarásában lennék érdekelt. Pultalul árulnák a szilvelekvárt a talpasaim, dílerhálózatom, savanyú káposztát és csalamádét terítene ártatlan gyermekek között. De ma nem az én gonosz terveim vannak a középpontban, hanem az EU-s pénzekkel való visszaélés Magyarországra gyakorolt hatása. Szóltajtunk arról is, hogy az olasz maffia hogyan használja fel az uniós forrásokat, és leszedjük a keresztvizet még egy rakás EU tagállamról. Igen, rád gondolok, boldog Ausztria. A nemrég beiktatott új parlament néhány képviselőjével beszélgetek ma az Európai Parlament brüsszeli épületének a pincéjében, ahol valami sajátosoknál fogva berendeztek egy tévéstúdiót egy folyosó kellős közepén. Sajnos a parlament épületében nem engedtek be, csak tisztességesen felöltözve, de ígérem, milyen többet nem történik. Daniel Freund, német politikus, 2019 óta az Európai Parlament tagja a Zöldek Európai Szabad Szövetség képviselő csoportjában. Egy független etikai testület létrehozását szeretné elérni, amely az uniós intézményekben fellépő összeférhetetlenséget követné és büntetné. A magyar kormány kifejezett ellenségének tekinti, mivel Freund harciosan követeli az Orbán rendszer visszaéléseinek büntetését. Sabrina Pinya Dóli 2019 óta képviseli Olaszországot az LP-ben, újságíróként maffia témákra szakosodott, képviselőként pedig bűnszövetkezetek jelenségével kapcsolatban ad tanácsot a vonatkozó EU bizottságnak. 
Gwendoline Delbos Corfield, az Európai Zöldpárt francia tagja, szintén képviselő. Korábban a Nőjogi és Esélyegyenlőségi Bizottság alelnöke volt, 2021 óta pedig a konferencia Európa jövőjéről küldöttségi tagja. Hello and welcome and thanks for joining me on this very hot day in this very hot basement, which is where I belong, at the basement of the European Parliament. And we're here to talk about uh, fraud, corruption, mafia, all the things we love. Um, and especially the use and abuse of EU funds and what can be done about that. So let's start with you, Gwendolyn, because you have been torpedoing the upcoming EU presidency of Hungary. Not really torpedoing the presidency of Hungary, but you have been working on making sure that this, um, this round of EU presidency is harder or not possible to abuse. Can you tell us about this? It was very clear uh, already in 2011, 2013, and this parliament has always been at the forefront of saying, you know, what is happening in Hungary is not all right. It's not okay on fundamental rights. It's not okay on democracy, of independence of ju justice, pluralism of media, but also indeed on the abuse of EU funds and the abuse of money in general, because uh, the corruption level in Hungary is very strong. Uh, and at, on the title of that, we have have this, we have made the assessment in this parliament that uh, we consider this member state to not be completely a democracy anymore. And we voted it with a huge majority. It is now something that is even taken upon by others, the fact that we are in a quasi-autocracy in Hungary. And so the idea that uh, we doing the show in a normal way and business as usual, we have a Hungarian presidency, was completely unbearable for us in parliament, but only for us. Uh, the member states, the other leaders of the member states, the people in commission and elsewhere, they didn't seem to find it bizarre. They said it was business as usual and they didn't care. So we are in this very uh, strange situation where a member state that is no more considered as a democracy, a member state that is a clear link to Putin, um, who has been abusing uh, a number of, of EU values and EU rights and has also said really bizarre things on a geopolitical point of view, saying bad things about Ukraine, saying bad things about a number of people. Uh, there are people be, too. <laughs> will be able to have presidency and Viktor Orban will be able to set an agenda, uh, go outside and say things in the middle of the Trump possible election in America, he will be able to be the voice of, uh, of, uh, of uh, EU. Uh, so uh, this is a very star a bad start of this new term. My understanding of what's happening here is that the EU started out as this very loose, very patiently organized alliance of member states, or let's just say first signatories joining for certain projects but it was always a very cautious association between parties who used to be at war with each other for a couple hundred years, right? And some are pushing for a, a more, if not centralized, but st more strongly organized and controlled kind of cooperation. And some are more in favor of just economic cooperation, letting everyone do what they will type of modus operandi. Is that a, a fair reading or is there something that I'm missing because I'm lazy to read news? <laughs> no, I think there's always been the paradox that you have. It was born out of big dreams. So it was not born out of caution. It was born out of the dream of getting out of, of war, being in peace and having values. And what is written in the treaties and the text is very strong, in fact, and it has symbolized for a lot of people a project of values, a project of peace, a project of being all equal citizens, uh, benefiting from the same rights and, and no more making a difference if you are a citizen of this member state or that member state. So it does symbolize that, but it's true that in the way that it has got organized with the structures and specifically the way the leaders of the member states do it, it's, it's been this cautious approach. So we've always been in between um, and uh, in until all of the member states were basically applying the rules, uh, not treading on each foot. And uh, indeed, we thought we were, we were having democracy forever. 
it could go fine. But the moment one of these member states starting to know more via democracy and an autocrat starting to be leading one of this party, the, this very cautious approach meant that the other leaders just let things happen more and more and more and more to a level where today it's very difficult to, to know how we'll come back to regular system and, and to European values in, in Hungary. So the cautious approach uh, was fine with, with only nice guys around the table. They were not all very nice, but they were correct. And the day there was a bad one, he just decided, I changed the, the, the rules of the games and the others weren't, didn't dare and say anything. And he has set a precedent that could mean others will do it. And I. And I have the feeling that Georgia Meloni, but also uh, Mr. Mitsotakis, Prime Minister of Greece, is exactly applying the Orban playbook, which is, I'm not, a, I'm not playing with the rules, I'm doing whatever I want with the values, and I will have problems in the Court of Justice of Europe, I will have bad resolution coming from the Parliament, but I don't care. And I know that in the end, I will profit from what exactly what you said, all the economic benefits, the organization, the workers being able to travel from one place to another. I will be able to be sitting at the table and take big decisions, but I will not apply the values. I'm of the opinion that this is not the doing of one, uh, one country, one party, or let alone one man. And the, um, the second coming of the genius of the Carpathians, as we like to sometimes call him, or the self-imposed strongman of Europe is actually a facade who served as sometimes a useful idiot for uh, more conservative um, uh, agendas to push the median toward more extreme, um, more extreme sort of points of um, negotiation. And there are very, very strong uh, sort of precursors to this kind of abuse of benevolent collaborations. But the nature of the sort of benevolent collaboration shows itself also on the procedural level I think, I mean, what is so special about what uh, Viktor Orban has done in, in Hungary is the, the enormous scale of, of corruption. That doesn't exist anywhere else on, on this scale, so centralized from the political office of, of the prime minister of a member state. It's an 18th century style sort of... Uh, well, it's a, it's a mafia state. It's, it's basically, and, and I think what you said earlier about the, the ideology of, of Orban, I think at the end of the day, the only true ideology of this man is he wants to get as much money out of the union for himself, for his family and friends as possible. <gasps> so when How you, dare you say that when, about my prime minister I never voted for? <laughs> when, when you look at, you know, he has been in office now 14 years. Hungary has received over 50 billion euros of EU funds since, in, since he became prime minister. That sounds painful to hear. And Transparency International estimates that at least 25% of that money has been stolen. Uh, by Orban and his cronies. So this is not just a few millions here and there. This is corruption on an industrial scale where at several periods they actually didn't know what to do with all this money anymore. You know, they started taking over industry after industry, financial industry, construction. They have bought the mobile phone networks. and But they couldn't, in a way, put all this money into Hungary, so they started buying up media in, in Slovenia, in, 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 Slovenia, Croatia, in Serbia, and in, in, in other... Slovakia as well? Yeah. Um, so, so it keeps exporting uh, this, this weird corrupt system it's also, also to other member that, states. that somehow the new ownership of Euronews can be tied partially to the order regime, which is also very encouraging. No, no idea about that, but the, the problem is then that, you know, in a, in a way the EU funded the destruction of Hungarian democracy and media freedom and uh, judicial independence and all this, you know, that was subsidized with EU funds. And for far too long, the union basically did nothing and, and looked at it uh, with amazement, but, but didn't do anything. And then, well, when the three of us came, came to the parliament in 2019, it was said, look, you can't do anything about this. Orban has a veto. Orban is member of the most powerful political party family, uh, the EPP. So forget 
doing anything about this. And I think... By the way, we've been trying to get EPP members to come on this discussion, but we haven't succeeded. If they are interested, please hit me up because we're very happy to talk with you. It's going to be very pleasant. And, and what we have managed here in the parliament now in this term, you know, other than requalifying Hungary as an electoral autocracy and, and reporting everything that has done is, well, that for the first time now we have the tool of freezing funds to member states when they are corrupt, when they don't have a functioning judiciary anymore. And we did that. And today, a majority of EU funds in Hungary are frozen until the necessary reforms are, are done. And the system is shaking, arguably, in, in large part due to this. I think moral outrage only goes I, I think, so far. I mean, for, for me, Poland is basically the example that has shown that this approach can work. You know, we... Yeah, but we, then you're basically advocating ex semi-externally induced regime change. No, but I... I advocate that we no longer fund the destruction of democracy in a member state with EU funds. As soon as they fulfill that criteria again, they can have the money. If in the meantime voters decide that they want a government that assures that EU funds are f f coming to the people that who they're meant for, uh, you know, that's up to, to, to the voters' choice. That's exactly what Polish voters did. It wasn't the only reason, but it was one of the determining factors of why Polish particularly Polish women, uh, voted uh, out the peace government. In Hungary so far, we haven't seen that. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the European some, election some results are, uh, are, are, are... There are some interesting elements in this, but we haven't seen that, you know, uh, Orban is really under pressure now with... We've Manino seen Trump. significant change in municipal elections which happened on the same date, which Fidesz thought was going to be beneficial for them, but turned out... Otherwise, which is nice, they still have a, a great portion of representation in municipalities, but way smaller than they used to. So, I guess that's something, but we'll see in two years by the next uh, sort of electoral round. Um, the way you explain enforcing consequences of actions makes me think about, would you talk to my preteen about her math homework, please? Because this is the same kind of fight that we have all, time, all the time, over and over again. You do something, there's a consequence. You don't do something, there's a consequence. Mm -hmm. But you have smaller children, right? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're very well prepared for I, teenage, uh, I, teenage. I, I can't cut their funding uh, quite yet. <laughs> well, there's going to be pocket money that you can, and yeah. allowances that you will be able to cut later on. And especially screen times. I highly encourage that. <laughs> Ha tetszik, amit látsz, és megengedheted magadnak, akkor kérlek támogasd a munkánkat a patreon.com per eurozine oldalon. A támogatók premier előtt hozzáférnek az adásokhoz, kérdéseket és témaötleteket írhatnak, és örök dicsőség a jutalmuk. De most már térjünk vissza a beszélgetéshez. Sabrina, let me come to you, because I sometimes feel that by this very strong focus on Hungary, um, there has been, which I appreciate, both because things must change in Hungary, so the state of democracy has eroded in Hungary, but also because I for sure wouldn't have an international career without Mr. Orban, because my complaining about my country was interesting for nobody before. So that's quite nice. Uh, I would love to work in my home country again, but maybe that's beyond my ambitions at this point. But I feel like this is a little bit disrespectful to say that Orban invented this, to always credit Hungary for abusing benevolent cooperation um, or abusing the rules, because it seems like we are entirely forgetting about Nicola Sarkozy and Berlusconi, of all people, who kind of pioneered this within the EU. Yes, uh, because uh, the problem of uh, Hungarian is uh, not uh, only the problem of Hungary. We have uh, a lot of problems uh, for uh, the rule of law, for example, uh, also in Italy, for independence of uh, the media. Uh, the uh, Italian public uh, television is uh, completely under the uh, control of the government. And so it's not uh, exactly uh, respectful of uh, the rule of law. And uh, the, yes, the possibility to uh, do some frauds with uh, European funds is not uh, typical only with Bulgaria. I think, uh, for example, I'm in uh, the um, uh, 
um, control of budget committee. And uh, we work a lot about uh, Babish, about uh, Ch Czech Republic, uh, but uh, also sometimes we find in Italy the, uh, some uh, criminal organization uh, um, or uh, some organized crime that are uh, uh, preparing uh, uh, frauds uh, with uh, European funds and uh, some uh, member of uh, the states uh, with uh, the public administration are involved. And if uh, uh, we have not a real contrast, but uh, the head of the government is involved in this kind of uh, frauds, it's very difficult for a state to fight against this kind of fraud. And I don't see that any EU member states would have a monopoly on the abuse of human rights either. So that's also quite evenly distributed between the West and the East of Europe, if you just go by these, these two measurements. But sometimes depend of uh, the government. We have, uh, for example, uh, in Italy, the situation uh, before was better. But now in Italy, we have some uh, manifestation and some public uh, events against abortion, for example. And so, uh, and uh, also the, the public television, the possibility to express uh, your opinion. There are a lot of journalists uh, that are going away from the public television. Uh, and uh, because it's impossible, they, they say uh, that uh, uh, they check also the single word in, uh, in an article, in a speech in the television. And I think it's not a freedom of, uh, of expression. Of course, you're right. I mean, if, if, if all of these member states, whatever governments they had through the years, were not uh, courageous enough to act and were not feeling able to stop Viktor Orban, it's, there's a part of this original way of doing it, which is we don't interfere in each other's things, but it's also, of course, the, the, the fear that, you know, and I'm not perfect either in my member states, so how can I judge the other one? And specifically, we know on the freezing of the funds, when they had to take the decision in this big discussion around the MFF, was a very complicated one, and some member states were really pushing for this new conditionality mechanism. We know that, for example, Italy was one of these member states that were not really willing for, for it completely because they were very afraid that they could be at the... At, uh, at one moment also targeted with this conditionality. I mean, this conditionality mechanism was not easy to put in place because a lot of member states didn't like it. And we have a number of cases where they don't want to act because they know that they are facing the same problems. But what has to be very clear is that where, where Viktor Orban pioneered even more than the others is in the systemic way of doing things. He attacked all of the things and in the scale. Uh, as it was said, it's the scale for corruption, but it's also the scale of attacking human rights. It's also the scale of attacking democracy. So we, we have a phenomenon that is, is massively bigger than elsewhere. But of course, we have failings everywhere. And I, all right, all right. Okay, I'll give, the, give him that. <laughs> no, I was just thinking, because it was what Gwendolyn said, this whole non-interference in the internal affairs of another country. You know, that's whatever Westphalian freedom uh, uh, or peace uh, 300 years ago is sort of principle of international diplomacy, right? But here, this is not interference in internal affairs. We have, in the European Union, decided we have a joint parliament together, we adopt laws together, uh, and all EU citizens are entitled to their fundamental rights and to the application of this law wherever they go in this union. It doesn't mean that, you know, I have those rights only when I'm in Germany. I have that right in every single member state, including in Hungary. But that if, if that assurance of these rights breaks down, if I can no longer, you know, uh, sue for those rights in a Hungarian court, if my EU funds are no longer protected in, in, in one or other member state, you know, this is not just the interest of one member state, this is the interest of all member states. And, and that is one of the key problems that we have and what we see now also with the presidency is sort of everyone saying, oh yeah, but that's not my problem, Hungary needs to take care of that. The European Union cannot work like that. When you have someone that abuses the system on the scale that Viktor Orban does, it's not just something that you can leave 
for Hungarian voters to sort out or for the internal machine in Hungary. And, and certainly the corruption you cannot just leave to Hungary because, well, Orban has transformed the system where there is no longer any controls on EU funds being abused. So that's why in that case, it then needs the entire EU to, to start looking at that problem and, and, and try to solve it and not just leave it to Hungary. I think you can leave corruption to us, we can take care of it. <laughs> In the sense, like, whatever needs doing about it. But, um, so then, when we talk about freezing funds, of course it became kind of a domestic rallying cry, and it is a rallying cry also in countries where it has been levitated, that they might, need, might be facing similar consequences. So, this, is a, this can be abused for a pol political agenda, to fuel Euroscepticism, Eurocriticism, and say, see, they're trying to intervene here. We've seen a couple of examples, for instance, uh, direct funding to uh, civil society coming from the EU, which usually the EU does not really engage directly with, because it's very bureaucratic. These are much bigger chunks of funding. So, you know, a barefoot NGO would have a hard time even managing these funds, yeah. let alone co-funding them but also to municipalities, which basically is the survival method of Budapest at this point, which is being strangled and bled out mm. by the state. Is this kind of direct funding then a turn in how EU funding is organized? Do you think, do you all think that funding, uh, funding compliant projects or valuable projects directly instead of through the nation state is going to be the route for everyone? Or is this like an exceptional thing that we keep for the bad kids? So, I mean, the problem is at the moment, only a very sm small share of EU funds is distributed directly by, by the commission. There are a few programs, but the lion's share, 90% of, of the funding is basically handed to the member states and they then distribute. In some member states, federal states, they hand it down to the regions or the cities. Sometimes it's the national government distributing, depending on what funding line we look at. When we negotiated the conditionality, the parliament, me as one of the negotiators, put a lot of emphasis that the commission should make sure to reduce the collateral damage, so to speak. You know, that when funding is frozen, the, the people suffering from that should not be the ordinary citizens that actually should receive this money to whatever, renovate their schools, a hospital, to, a school, to, a to bring fast whatever. internet uh, to the countryside, whatever it is. But that this should be a sanction against the national government that is not in compliance with EU values, with rule of law and, and with anti-corruption measures. The problem is a bit, if you now reroute all the funds directly, well, first of all, it would need at about six to eight thousand uh, Hungarian speakers, experts of uh, public procurement uh, legislation in Hungary. So this is not I something that- I have a that, lot of friends. Yeah, but that you can build up overnight and then dismantle again the moment that hopefully a future Hungarian government actually complies with the, with the rules. And the other effect would then be, I mean, if the money is still all going, is there then actually any kind of punitive effect and does the behavior of, of the government then actually change or not? So in practice, it's, it's difficult. And we see that at the moment, yeah, there is some collateral damage. But I think what I would always say to, to my fellow Hungarian uh, Europeans is, look, actually the, the money being frozen doesn't change anything for you because whether the, the only person that is in a way suffering from this money not going is uh, the likes of Metzaros uh, and, and other friends and family of, of, of Viktor Orban because they would be otherwise stealing uh, those funds from you anyways. But it's true that this promise was made a lot in Hungary, I know, because when I would go to Hungary, immediately people would say, well, you're going to give us the money directly, aren't you? So there were politicians in Hungary, I think that a bit mislead, misled the people uh, because honestly, on a pragmatic point of view, it's... Uh, the Commission has no operational way of doing it. It's not true and it's not going to happen overnight, like Daniel said, because it would mean so many people to do it. Uh, it's also true that it's, it's not a long-term wish of the member states. Member states still like to be the ones in power to distribute the money and not have direct communication between Europe and municipalities or Europe and, and, and stakeholders. That being said, I think uh, if we were creative and, and if 
EU doesn't turn too bad because we also are a bit afraid of, of the new powers in place. Um, but if, if we were to go on this path of trying to uh, integrate a bit more on certain point of view and also uh, improve the rule of law aspect, we could think of specific things where it would be legitimate for the Commission to, to, to fund directly. We were all very sad that uh, Erasmus and Horizon were affected because this, these are specifically programs that do foster the European values, make interconnection, make people meet. So in fact, in this case, Europe was, EU was in fact punishing itself a bit in, uh, and, and it would be two small programs that it's not complicated for the Commission to work directly with university, with schools and all this. So we could start thinking of that. And there's another path that has been explored, um, pushed a lot by mayors, like the mayor of Budapest or the mayor of Warsaw when peace was still in indeed. power, which is indeed the recovery funds. These recovery funds had a number of criteria to be given. It was having green politics, uh, to, you know, it was to recover from COVID, and there was a push in this parliament and uh, through the mayors to say, you know, some of this money now for the green transition specifically needs to go directly to the municipalities because green transition is done by the cities. It's, it's, it's really the good level to do green transition. And also because we did, we, we acknowledge the fact that in Hungary and Poland, um, citizens of big cities who had chosen opponent mayors were in fact punished by their own country and we are at a level of punishment in Budapest that is now crazy. I mean, it, it, is, it is quite amazing in fact that citizens of Budapest re-elect the same mayor because it's not honestly not in their interest. I mean, uh, today they're having waste problems, they're having transport problems, they're having a number of problems because all funds have been cut from the central state to Budapest and there again, um, some of this is European money with European use, and, and we need to be much more careful on this. I, I must sort of shade or nuance this perception because on the, as, a, as a Budapest resident, uh, on the level of governance, there are waste problems, there are uh, transport problems, but on, on the level of your daily experience as a denizen in the Budapest metro area, the level and the quality and the dependability of public services is still Maintained. outstanding within Europe. And that is specifically, in my understanding, because this country and this culture is tuned to scarcity economy and making do with what we get and moving things around and finding a way and all of that. Mm. I think it's been an incredible feat, but it's also telling that the current mayor of Budapest was re-elected by a margin of 40-something votes, not 40-something percent yeah. or 40 something thousand, 40 something votes. So it really shows that there is a, a very direct political effect in, in blackmailing, for instance, the residents of a settlement uh, by a government and they have the means. Mm -hmm. I think it's actually quite hard to guarantee that a government does not abuse this possibility, but then on the level of, for instance, these kinds of public services, especially trash, which is a hot question in Brussels, which is one of the dirtiest cities in Western Europe, uh, for very specific reasons, um, then the Italian mafia's involvement yes. with public services comes to mind. Well, we're in, yes, in a situation of illegality, it's easier for a mafia to enter and to do business, obviously. And uh, mafia uh, is not only in Italy. I know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's transnational. And uh, now uh, mafia uh, uh, has understand that uh, uh, it's easier corrupt someone than uh, use violence because uh, violence is uh, so evident and uh, the police uh, uh, start to do investigation and so on, like in Duisburg in uh, Germany. But uh, if you... Um, corrupt someone. The corruption is very difficult to uh, investigate because uh, we have uh, two people that are both interested that everything uh, stay covered 
And so it's very difficult in Italy, for example, our government uh, started to um, decide to put uh, corruption in the list of uh, the crimes so that it's possible to uh, use uh, Trojan on the, mo uh, on the mobile. But uh, now the <laughs> new government of Meloni delayed every uh, um, procedure, every um, law to uh, combat, to fight uh, corruption. Uh, corruption is uh, the easier way that uh, organized crime can enter and that mafia can enter into business. Out of uh, the Sicily, for example, out of uh, Calabria or so on, they, uh, appear, they, are, uh, they look like uh, entrepreneurs normal entrepreneurs and so they uh, create problem with uh, the legal economy, they create probably with democracy, obviously with corruption, and they, uh, they enter in the use of the funds because uh, we, we have, uh, we have a, uh, a lot of investigation about, uh, for example, Malta or uh, uh, Slovakia, uh, and uh, mafia is doing business uh, and corruption is uh, the best way to enter. And I think Slovakia is a, is a glaring example of when the mafia starts to employ straightforwardly violent methods, it does or, or can have an immediate ripple effect, a government can fall, but systemic corruption is a much more lasting methodology, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And we have also seen, and I think this has implications also for the freezing of funds and how those have to be considered a long-term effect, because we have seen quite a number of these more authoritarian and kleptocratic uh, governments fall across Europe to some kind of a mishmash coalition that then doesn't stand its ground and then the original contender comes back with a vengeance. A műsor mozgatórugója a Display Europe. Ez az új tartalom megosztó platform, amely 15 különböző nyelven kínál cikkeket, podcastokat és videókat európai kultúráról, politikáról és közösségekről, még csak nem is él vissza a felhasználói adataiddal. Hihetetlen, nem? De igaz. Itt egy kis ízelítő a sajtó szemléjükből. The last few elections in Europe have been extremely intense, reflecting the polarization of political discourse across the continent, says Catherine André in her press review. After failing to be appointed France's new prime minister, Jordan Bardella has become the president of the newly formed Patriots for Europe. In The Guardian, Muda argues that this new group is merely another hollow victory for the far right. Polarization is growing across Europe and the West. Nowhere is this clearer than in the former Soviet Republic of Georgia, writes the Italian political scientist Natalie Tocci in The Guardian. She even wonders about democracy's chances of survival in the country. Most pedig vissza a beszélgetéshez. The political consensus is shifting to the right within the European Parliament as well. And that has major implications for procedures regarding the rule of law, for uh, corruption on the more economic side, which again, so much more sustainable. If you hold a gun to the head of a journalist, that's relatively easy to prove. If you just make it impossible for them to make a living, they're going to leave by themselves, sort of voluntarily. Mm. Um, but there's a there's a green transition that would need to happen or would have needed to happen like a decade and a half, two decades ago already, and is being obstructed and delayed on so many levels. And we are in this basement and it's very hot. So we are constantly reminded of the fact that we're very late on this one. I mean, if we, if we first look at the, at the new majorities that we have now in this parliament when it comes to rule of law, I think, I mean, the majorities here in the House on, on all the Hungary resolutions on the proposal to freeze funds and so on, there have been very solid three-quarter uh, majorities. And I don't think that overall picture is likely to change. There is still going to be, you know, from the EPP over Social Democrats, Liberals, Greens, Left, I, I would expect will continue to support this, even if we have lost a few votes to, to, to the extreme right. But the dynamic that is fundamentally changing now is the progressive majority, Social Democrats, Liberals, Greens and Left, we had a majority on paper in the last parliament. So when I was sitting in the negotiations, for example, saying, look, let's sue Ursula von der Leyen because she 
gave 10 billion uh, to Viktor Orban so that he stops blocking the Ukraine accession and the, and the financial support. I could then argue, look, I would love to have the conservatives on board, that we have a broad majority in favor of the rule of law, but if you absolutely don't want, we're going to do it with the progressive majority without you. And, and that pressure point is now lost. Mm. From now on, it's basically the EPP, it's the conservative parties that will decide, yes or no, is anything happening? And maybe on Hungary, the general line will hold. What, what majority exactly forms? Will they continue with the Green Deal and to what extent? I mean, the extreme right has basically been running a campaign against everything, no Green Deal, let's scrap that. But even the Conservatives basically ran a campaign against their own Spitzenkandidat, against their own lead candidate Ursula von der Leyen, and were saying, look, we have this long list of things in the Green Deal that we want gone. The end of the internal combustion engine should be revisited. Uh, fertilizers they killed on, on agriculture in general, they don't want anything. Uh, so. And, and whether there will be majorities also to provide the necessary funding, the investment in renewable energy, in uh, European-wide electricity grids and, and so on, that, that's the question. I would hope that the argument is so strong now that even if you don't care about climate change and our responsibility to future generations or the rest of the world, that even just from a purely economic point of view, when you look at how the Americans investing, when you look at what the Chinese are investing in electric vehicles, in batteries, in solar panels, in heat pumps, in, in all the technologies that we need. If we Europeans do not massively invest, if we do not pursue the Green Deal uh, as before, what are we going to earn our money with in the future? The national level is, is exactly the level that is not interesting for, climate, for fighting climate change. It's, it's, in the, it's in the duality of European big decisions and big programs and big investment investment and the actions on the ground in municipalities, in cities, in villages, that things will happen. But the national level is quite irrelevant in the, in, in the fighting for climate change. Uh, so if we have a, a weak Europe, <clears throat> we will see uh, no big improvement on, on green transition. We will still have everywhere in Europe cities uh, mayors, uh, but also people in rural areas trying to do things on the ground, but it won't be sufficient because they won't have this, this big format, this big infrastructure's investment on the, European, on, the, on the European level. And what is also interesting on the corruption aspect and the public procurement aspect is that, of course, today, uh, you're right, Daniel, uh, it's not a good uh, mathematical a calcul to make to, to not want to invest in transition, but that being said, big fortunes today of EU are traditional big fortunes coming from fossil fuels or, or old ways of doing, um, and they have uh, too much of an ear uh, in number of politicians on, on national level or on the European Parliament. This is also something that is a problem if we really need to work better on transparency, on, on lobbying, on how public procurement are run, and on who is friend with who in this parliament also, because until uh, a number of politicians here have, are too much friend with, with fossil, <laughs> fossil fuel people, we will, we will not see the big changes. And that's what we saw in the last month of the mandate, where suddenly we were, you know, uh, putting the brakes on a number of things because a number of politicians here, conservative politicians, were saying, my friend in, in fertilizer is not happy, my friend in automobile is not happy, my friend there, my friend there, uh, which is not good, helping. Yeah, well, we have to think about their career paths now <laughs> seriously because usually for an outgoing MEP, it used to be an option to immediately exactly. go to lobbying and now they have to wait six months until they can they become can. a professional no, no, lobbyist. No, they, they, they don't have to wait. They just, uh, it's more complicated to get an access badge to the parliament. So quite honestly, the roadblocks that, I mean, Gwen and I have fought it's so hard to get uh, a cooling off period and stuff, but what has actually been put in place, uh, very I, I, I don't think is much of an ox obstacle to any serious lobbyist. Yeah, but then, <laughs> then it's an inconvenience to not have immediately <laughs> exactly. an access badge. Yeah. Sabrina? I think it's important uh, also to uh, think about uh, the communication. I think we have a problem of communication of Green Deal. It's very difficult to communicate the importance of the law 
here in the parliament. And uh, also uh, the, the storytelling is completely uh, different of the reality. For example, uh, the, the cars uh, in Italy, everyone uh, thinks that uh, has to change the car at uh, 2035. No, simply uh, we can't produce car with uh, engine with uh, combustion. Yes, and, and so is also a problem of communication. And I think that uh, European institutions should be more to uh, well communicate uh, the policy of uh, Europe. In 2032, that's quite far away. So until then, you can raise enough oxen to pull your old diesel cars to drive around, I think. Mm -hmm. But that's also a means of transition. I am an optimist, ultimately, in terms of this sort of economic push, when you said, what are we going to be competitive in, we have a great many big white marble statues and all the tourists in the world can come here and watch them sink into the sea. Mm -hmm. So that's an option. Mm -hmm. If you want something else, maybe there's Underwater museums is uh, <laughs> really the future of Europe, I guess. Indeed, there's a wonderful one in Crimea with all the Lenins and Marxists that have been collected and sort of uh, endowed into the seafloor. It's kind of hard to visit right now. Yeah. I don't recommend. Thank you so much for coming. And um, Thank you. get a great many things done in this new cycle, please. De mit gondolsz, kapjon több felhatalmazást az EU, vagy inkább hagyják a tagállamokat a saját szakállukra intézni a dolgaikat? Írd meg a véleményedet kommentben, és ha tetszett az adást, nyomj egy lájkot, és iratkozz fel a csatornánkra. Aztán nyomd meg a kis csengőikont, és még áll be 7-14 külön értesítést, hogy egy újabb adásról sem maradj le. Küldd el ezt a műsort a kedvenc néni kérnek, meg a legmorgósabb nagybátyádnak is, és ha van kedved, támogass minket a patreon.com per eurozine oldalon. Ez a műsor ugyanis az Eurozin produkciója. Ha még nem hallottál az Eurozinról, akkor spuri azonnal nézd meg a weboldalunkat. Ez a remek online magazin hiányterméket árul méghozzá ingyen, minőségi lassú újságírást mindarról, amiről érdemes az embernek ma gondolkodni. Európa szerte száznál is több partnerlapot szemlézünk és fordítunk angolra, illetve saját tartalmainkkal mutatjuk az utat a digitális zajban. Ez a beszélgetős műsor az Európai Unió Kreatív Európa programja és az Európai Kulturális Alapítvány társfinanszírozásával készül. Fontos megjegyezni, hogy az itt kifejtett nézetek és vélemények csak a felszólalók és a szerzőké, és nem feltétlenül tükrözik az Európai Unió vagy az Európai Oktatás és Kulturális Végrehajtó Ügynökség véleményét, mert azok tisztesség és finanszírozóként a magyar kormány ellentétben nem pofáznak abba bele, hogy nekünk mi legyen a mélepényünk. Sem az Európai Unió, sem az EACA nem tehető felelőssé az itt kifejtett nézetekért, de nem mintha nagyon bánnánk, hogy esetleg megfogadják a tanácsainkat. Köszönjük az Európai Parlament stúdiójának is, hogy vendégül látott minket.